The nationalist terror was ferocious and from their point of view necessary. There was stalemate across the mountains north of Madrid, so the nationalist strategy to capture it now involved the army of Africa sweeping from the south across vast areas of Republican Spain. The working class population was hostile. They had to be cowed. From his base in Seville, General Capo de Llano roared nightly threats to what over the radio he called the Republican rabble. On the 25th of July, he announced, let it be known, for every right-wing person killed in the villages, I shall kill ten, and perhaps exceed this proportion. This was to prove no idle threat. In Laura del Rio, the Andalusian village where the revolution had brought the people meet for the first time, and local right-wingers had been arrested, time was catching up. The civil war's justice of vengeance was underway. Further down the valley, nationalist troops were advancing. In village to village, anyone who resisted was summarily shot. <laughs> The nationalist troops had left Seville for the villages, and wherever they went, they just cleaned the place up. They dealt with anybody they wanted to. This one, boom, dead. I know about you, Paco, bang. No procedures were followed. A simple accusation was enough. The threatening advance created panic in Laura del Rio. The village prison records show that as the nationalist troops advanced, all the right-wingers who had been locked up were taken out and handed over to the Revolutionary Committee. Entregado al Comité. The same names on the graveyard memorial show what those words meant. Anyone delivered to the Committee for Justice was shot. When the nationalists took the village, the killing began again. The prison records for the following weeks tell the other side of the war's history of reciprocal revenge. I didn't see anything. No, I heard it. It was such a scandal. I heard the trucks pass and the shots and more trucks and more shots. They swept them all away. I lived on that street, along by the railway line. You can see that the cemetery is very near. It's there where those trees are. So we could hear, especially in the silence of the night. When we heard the trucks passing at 3 a.m., we knew what it was. Rojo means red. To the nationalists, all opponents were red, and if captured, shot. Local landowners in Andalusia joined the nationalist columns. We had risen against something we considered disastrous for the country, because they were killing our relatives, attacking our farms. For me, it meant the liberation of our country. For me, it was the war against communism. In my heart, I was anti-communist. You see, it wasn't against the Republic as such. It was a question of communism or not. In this country, there was a red revolution. As an individual, a worker may be good, bad or indifferent, the same as a boss, the same as a businessman, the same as anybody, and yet collectively they're terrible. The workers as an entity will always be selfish. They have never considered the country's well-being as a whole. That sort of hatred is past reason or compromise. Moreno de la Cova and other landowners joined the columns making their way through Andalusia to avenge their murdered families, reclaim their lands snatched by the revolution, to execute the Red Resistance. While the nationalist columns were wiping up opposition in the rear, the Army of Africa, Franco's Moors, marched along the road to Madrid.
they took Merida in the first proper battle of the war. This linked them with the nationalists in the north. Ahead lay Madrid, but the frontier town of Badajoz, with a garrison loyal to the Republic, was cut off. The battle for Badajoz was ferocious. The army of Africa, the Moors and the Foreign Legion, won a bloody victory at great cost of life. First on the scene after the battle was Portuguese journalist Mario Neves. It was terrible. The Moors were capable of anything. I suppose they were excited since they had come all the way from Morocco, had flown over the Strait of Seville and had fought violent battles on the way to Badajoz. An officer warned us not to speak to the legionnaires because they were so violent. A column of some 120 men in a state of total madness arrived at these walls and advanced only to be crushed by gunfire. Once the legionnaires had breached the defences, they went berserk. Nevis followed their rampage. Forty-five years later, he returned for the first time. People were trying to escape, and they usually tied a white handkerchief round their left arm. But the rebels, who were looking for fighters, pulled their shirts, or rather tore them away violently, to find the mark left by the gun. As they had been fighting a lot, the gun left a black mark, and this was enough for them to be immediately arrested and to endure the fate we all can guess. They herded them into the bullring. No trials, of course. No inquiry. No questions. Just the swift bullet. I wanted to go to the bullring where people had told me there were several prisoners and piles of bodies. On my way there I saw a brook where heaps of bodies lay. There were heaps of them. They were in several dramatic postures which caused an extraordinary impression. I tried to get into the bullring and I succeeded. I talked to the guards and noticed that there were now just two bodies left in the middle of the ring, but I realized then that there were still several prisoners in the bullpens, but I was so disturbed I did not want to talk to them. They were obviously awaiting their final moment. It was said that more than 2,000 people were summarily shot by firing squad. Mario Neves got over his nausea and became a reporter again. I immediately tried to find out who were the authorities in the town, who was in charge. It turned out to be Colonel Yagwe, and I told him that everybody was talking about the shootings with horror. He expressed a certain indifference, and I asked him whether shootings were taking place, and if so, how many. I added that I had heard that 2,000 people had been shot. He looked at me, hesitated, and replied, probably not that many. But something in the way he said it left no doubts about the truth of the stories which had already spread all over town. Three days later, Yagwe was interviewed by an American reporter. Yagwe had his own estimate of the killings. Do you think I was going to take 4,000 red prisoners, he said, while my column marched against the clock? Of course we shot them. Should I have left them free behind me to let Badahoth become a red town again? No one knows, even now, how many died in the Badahoth massacre. The nationalists allow them no memorial. <laughs>